Hello, Zonda. Hello, Kevin. In the very last video, we were talking about being wrong. How does someone deal with being wrong? So what is wrong? What does it mean? Can we define what is wrong and how is that used in our lesson? Yes, yes. Um, what is wrong is just a starting point. Uh, but we have to be very careful about what we uh, think is wrong because there are many pitfalls that are awaiting the person that wants to solve the uh, solve a problem. You know, uh, your neck is not free, uh, and uh, apparently that is wrong. You should you should have the neck free, and so people start to uh, concentrate on the neck free and. Um, and I wanted to, to make sure that uh, uh, people understand clearly where, what we are at. So I'm going back to what we discussed last week. There was this uh, uh, text from Alexander where he said that uh, he begins by pointing out that we expect these different things to be wrong. And that they are being so is not a case for worry of apprehension, seeing that they assuredly can be corrected. So, um, w I already pointed to the fact that uh, there are different things. So, uh, it's, it's important to explain what Alexander means by uh, expect these different things to be wrong because we are going to see that uh, these errors are not uh, isolated errors, are not uh, errors that are uh, errors in themselves. They are errors in a coordination. So, uh, of course, there are concerted errors or at, at the same time we say uh, connected errors. And it's all, only through a connected approach where you're not going to correct one error and then correct another one and then correct another one uh, until the end of time. It's necessary to understand that you have to readjust the organism as a whole. Alexander said because it functions as a whole. So um, let us take, for example, uh, the case. This is Alexander writing, of course. Let us take, for example, the case of a pupil who has been accustomed to stiffen the muscle of his neck in all his daily activities. So this is wrong. Let's be clear. This is wrong. Yeah, he stiffened the muscle of his neck when it's not necessary. Uh, well, why, he, why is he doing that? So Alexander speaking again says that his teacher point this out to him and explain that this habit of stiffening the neck has come about because he is endeavoring to make his neck perform the function of other part of the psychophysical mechanism so that it is not an isolated defect. It's, an, uh, it's a defect that is connected with other harmful imperfections in the use of himself. His stiff neck, in fact, is merely a symptom of a general man mal coordination in the use of the mechanisms and any direct attempt to relax it means that he's dealing with it as a cause and not as a symptom. And such an attempt will result in comparative failure unless a satisfactory coordinated use of the mechanism in general is restored. Everything is said here. And uh, you might be surprised that uh, after Alexander was gone, uh, well, his uh, first generation teachers started all to claim that the, the neck was the cause. That if you were suddenly taught to free the neck or to experience what it is to free the neck, then, uh, because this is the cause of all the other problems, uh, then you would be free of any problem. But it's exactly the opposite of what Alexander is saying. Alexander is saying that the neck is only a, a symptom of a condition of general malcoordination. So, uh, to, to take uh, this example, 
uh, I need to explain um, what Alexander means when he says, or what I think he means, when he says that uh, the stiffening of the neck that the pupil is uh, accustomed to um, he happens because he's endeavoring to make his neck perform the function of other parts of the psychophysical mechanism. And, and sometimes uh, my students, they, they don't get it. They, they don't understand uh, what Alexander is talking about. So I have take, taken the case of one of my students. And so I, I, yep, I present one of my students. It, uh, he's having his second or third lesson, I don't remember. And um, uh, he's just standing for the camera. And I am, I'm starting to have him uh, recognize that there are bones inside his, uh, his structure. Uh, the bone that we call the anatomical structure. And uh, to have him realize that, I ask him to place a, a wooden ruler, a straight line, against uh, the middle of the lumbar region and the sacrum. It's the uh, middle of the lumbar re region to lower sacrum line, I call it. And so we can see that this line has an inclination. And uh, the general standing position is such that you can see that the, 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 the head and the neck are very far backward, the middle torso. And so this is what I call the straight neck posture where we see that the upper thoracic spine is uh, well subjected to a movement clearly backward relatively to the middle torso. Therefore, the upper thoracic spine is very far back. And in order to stay erect, the person is just, uh, well, pulling the head backward relatively to the middle torso. And so there is this, uh, uh, collapse of the larynx, this collapse of the uh, supporting structure of uh, the voice box that Alexander complained about. So, in, in what sense is that man endeavoring to do with the neck something he should be doing with something else? That is a, uh, that is a question. So, I have to follow and analyze with my student. These are images I use uh, during my lessons. Uh, so, I take less the images from the lesson before and I start discussing with my student what it is I see. What are the movements that are applied on the anatomical structure? And so we see that in standing, uh, the person has, uh, well, the middle torso very far forward. We see that the middle uh, lumbar spine is thrown forward. And uh, uh, that, of course, sends the lower rib cage very far forward. But then, of course, as, as I said before, there is this upper torso that is, uh, that is sent backward. And that helps us to understand uh, this uh, sentence that uh, Alexander is giving. He says this habit of stiffening the neck has come about because uh, the student is endeavoring to make his neck perform the function of other parts of the psychophysical mechanism so that it's not an isolated defect but connected with the other harmful imperfection in the use of the self. This is what Alexander is saying. And so now I can give an explanation of that sentence. I can say that, look at this. You, you will find that, of course, the person is standing over uh, the ankle. The ankle is the, Alexander called it the fulcrum. So it's a fulcrum of an inverted pendulum that is in equilibrium more or less in space. So what we see is that the lower leg is straight is just above uh, the supporting fulcrum, which is fine. But then from the superior part of the knee upward, we can see that, uh, well, uh, the superior part of the limb is really directed forward in space so that uh, we, we get that kind of line for uh, the lumbar region and we see that the weight of the whole structure is really thrown forward of, well, that supporting point. So there is an hyperextension of the knee and the whole structure is falling forward. So we suddenly, well, realize that there is a function 
for the stiffening of the neck, for the throwing back of the superior part of the spine and the throwing back of the uh, cervical spine relatively to the middle spine. But it, the, the gentleman is just maintaining an equilibrium. <laughs> if, if the upper torso was directed forward and up relatively to the middle torso, but the person would be falling forward. So we see that the person has a postural habit to maintain uh, his equilibrium. Well, it's not an equilibrium really. It's uh, it's uh, keeping himself uh, well uh, stiff enough. You you must understand that for uh, uh, the lower leg to uh, oppose the movement forward of the middle torso and lower torso with the upper torso, well, the lower leg must be directed back. The, uh, you, you must understand that uh, this muscle, I'm pointing with my cursor, which is, the, of course, the calf muscle that is uh, maintaining uh, the lower leg backward, is really straining here as well as uh, the direction of the shoulder backward and upward is, uh, is really intense in order to prevent the middle torso from falling. Not that the student is aware of any of this. The, w the, the student is doing all that without feeling anything. He's just, he's just feeling upright. This is his habitual way of standing. So there are efforts that are made all the time, but the person does not feel it. Well, now it may be interesting to you to understand that uh, this gentleman that is really doing all these movements is throwing, of course, the hips forward, is throwing the middle torso and the lower sternum forward, so the whole of the lower rib cage is forward and the whole of the upper rib cage is backward. This man, when he started having lessons with me, had already like more than 30 lessons of the modern Alexander technique, where he was taught to concentrate on the feeling of his neck, so that his neck would be free. And uh, this is the result I see. So, um, not understanding that uh, all these symptoms, all these wrong movements are connected can lead to spending a lot of money for for very little effect and so how can i make such a well a direct statement it, well it's that after just a few moments of understanding what we are discussing well uh, the student was uh, uh, suddenly able to create voluntary orders of movement with the different parts. And uh, as you will see, the voluntary orders of movements are more or less opposite to the one he's giving himself without knowing it when he's, uh, when he's standing. Uh, it's obvious that uh, he's, he's requested to get the upper torso forward and upward. And he's uh, requested to get uh, the inferior part of the knee forward instead of backward. It's, uh, it's obvious that the balance, instead of being maintained by strong efforts, strong muscular effort at the lower leg and upper torso, we are just asking him to, uh, as Alexander was saying, we are uh, requesting other parts to do the supporting job. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the same person is seen now supported so that the legs are beneath the, the lower and middle torso. And uh, more and more, I will ask him to get the upper torso forward even more. S and uh, what is the limit of that movement? Well, forward as long as he's going backward. And we can see that as a result of his uh, conscious orders of movement, this intention he has uh, uh, connected together in his, in his mind, well, we see that he's been, well, clearly, uh, well, lengthening the back. There is a, a marked widening in the middle and upper part of the back. We can see that as a result, the shoulders are less, uh, because uh, in these conditions, you will understand that all the muscles of the upper torso are uh, active and uh, shortening. And uh, the main muscles that are connecting the shoulders are connecting the shoulders to the head. 
And so this man is shortening the muscle of the neck and that explains how what we see as the shoulders so high raised toward the ears. Uh, why are the shoulders so high? And you can see that uh, this habit is still present even with the new support. The person is so used to shortening the muscle of the neck that the shoulders are already very high. So it's necessary to uh, work uh, in this way some more so that the person suddenly uh, find confidence because at first you must understand that if uh, the image on the left are for the person what is uh, uh, the habitual result of his directions the habitual result of the of his direction are guided by the feeling sense it's a somatic attitude that the person is having if the person feels that he's uh, standing upright the person feels that he's really uh, <coughs> going up and so that is the result of the the somatic direction of the movement while when the person start to organize the part so that the legs are really supporting the middle torso instead of the contraction of the muscle. When I say the legs, I mean the legs and all the elastic uh, systems that are present in the anatomical structure. But as you can see, uh, this uh, I will show a closer picture. Y you will see that uh, this new equilibrium is so different from the habitual one where all the weight of the middle torso is upon the front of the legs, that uh, the person is lifting the toes of the floor. And at first the person will tell me, well, I'm not, I'm not balanced. And I say, oh dear, uh, please explain, tell me, um, how do you know? And the person will say, well, it's very simple. My toes are, are off the ground. I am, I am falling backward. And it's, uh, it's quite an interesting statement because the person, um, of course, analyzes balance and equilibrium according to the feeling felt in the feet. This is what is called concentration in Alexander uh, books. Well, especially in the, the second one, Constructive Conscious Control of the Individual. And uh, uh, the person is directing the whole movement according to uh, well a, a feeling that the person is uh, concentrating upon and so the person does not realize that when well physically equilibrium has been um, promoted then the person old habit of contracting the muscle that lift the toes are very active and the person is telling me i am falling back when in fact uh, the person is not. The person will have to learn to lengthen the feet when in that condition. And uh, the, the, the demonstration is very simple. Uh, once the person starts to understand how to direct the knees and ankle mechanism and uh, get the feet on the floor, the person will still have uh, uh, this uh, well possibility of lifting the toes and feeling out of balance or directing the toes forward and not direct and not feeling out of balance which which now makes the feeling totally improper to to guide uh, the equilibrium of the whole structure so uh, we start with uh, a strange sentence where uh, the person has something wrong is doing something wrong stiffening the neck but the stiffening of the neck is not an isolated defect it's um, a connect it's, it's a defect that is connected with other harmful imperfection in the use of himself so i'm, I'm started to think that the use of himself it's the use of the parts and uh, it, the, the strange idea that the use of the part could be inside the part is uh, now impossible we we start to see that uh, when alexander is talking about the use of the part of the use of himself he's talking about the direction of the movement of these different parts and um, uh, this leads us to uh, a, a very important chapter the the third chapter in constructive conscious control where uh, 
the title of the chapter is Projection of Orders. And uh, uh, the first subtitle is the one I've shown here. It's Concentration and the Sustained Continuous uh, Projection of Order. So I must tell you that um, when I translated these books, it was during my, uh, my training course. And uh, there was one thing in my training course is that uh, um, we, we read these books, we discussed sentences, but curiously, this, uh, this chapter or this idea of projecting sustained orders was not, uh, was not explained in any way. We were told that uh, uh, the orders to be projected was neck free at forward and up back to lengthen and widen. So it was like uh, running in a circle because nobody could explain what it was to direct the neck to be free. And as we've seen, uh, the neck cannot be free by directing the neck. Uh, the freedom of the neck, the length of these muscles, the elasticity of these muscles depends on their geometry and their geometry has nothing to do with what you intend to or do not intend to do with the neck. You could, uh, uh, for example, create an intention in your mind that uh, you want your neck to be free, you want to think that the neck is free, you nearly want to feel that the neck is free too, and uh, this will lead to nothing. The student I have presented was not a particularly a stupid student, all the contrary, yeah? A very intelligent one. It's, it's just that uh, uh, his lessons, his somatic lessons, he had teachers uh, talk to him very gently and manipulate his body 30 hours <laughs> of work or more and uh, that amount of money for him to, in fact, had nothing, he had nothing at the end to reason about. Nothing. You cannot reason about neck free. Let the neck be free. It, uh, it's impossible. I, it will tend to have you more or less uh, concentrate on the neck. So, let's hear what Alexander has to say to start. It's the very start of the chapter. Little doubt that this conception of the employment of imitation involves specific attempts to gain an end. In other words, specific manifestations are selected for specific imitation. And thus, the process of imitation becomes one of fixating on specific points or object, that is, of what is known as concentration. This conception of concentration is a disastrous and narrowing one if we may judge by the use of the word as revealed in practice and by the harmful manifestation which follow the intention of a person to concentrate. So, bring back to the same discussion, this idea of concentration. So, uh, during his lesson, uh, the, the teacher has produced an experience. He has organized the parts of the pupil in a different way. And uh, at one moment he says, that's it. So when that's it, uh, the, the student must understand that what was wrong is now right. And uh, this is what uh, uh, the teacher is going to more or less suggest is that uh, uh, the student is going to be asked to associate uh, the word let the neck be free with uh, what the, pu the teacher has done with his hands when manipulating the torso, the neck, the head and all that. This is concentration. This will lead to the pupil concentrating on the neck. I have very often I have pupils saying to me, but should I not feel my neck to see if it's free? No, you shouldn't feel your neck to see if it's free because uh, when you are really pulling your neck back and down, you you feel just uh, stable. You feel safe. And very often you will discover that your conception of rest, your um, what, what you the feeling of rest comes out of reproducing what you uh, do most habitually. And so for the moment you're feeling off the neck absolutely not connected with what you're doing with the torso, with the spine, 
So feeling of the neck is absolutely in an uninteresting and dangerous because uh, the more you try to feel on the neck, the less you are, uh, well, using your mind to organize different movements that are uh, to happen at the same time. That's the, the disastrous effect of concentration. People are so used to concentrate on one problem, solve it and pass on to the second, so that when they come to a lesson of conscious guidance, where uh, suddenly they are asked to perform a gesture, and uh, the conscious control is applied on the different movements of the parts. We are not telling to the person you're pulling down or you're, you're having the neck, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, not organized in the proper way. We are just observing what are the movements and how the movements correspond to the plan that is being explicitly described when uh, creating the instructions of movements. So we, we have this difficulty fixating on specific points or objects. Of course, it's fixating the mind. We, we are not fixating the parts of the body on specific points or objects. No, it's that the mind is not directed accurately when you start to think, let the neck be free to let the head go forward and up. Uh, it's, uh, we, we are describing a result and there are no means whereby. So this is where the narrowing aspect of this teaching is really uh, obvious. In the just the next part of that uh, of the same book, Alexander says that the coordinated use of the different parts during any evolution, an evolution is uh, an experience of uh, movement guided consciously by the mind. Coordinated use of the different parts during any e evolution calls for the continuous conscious projection of orders to the different parts involved. The primary order concern with the guidance and control of the primary part of the act, which is the, the first movement of the act, uh, being continued whilst the orders connected with the secondary part of the movement are projected and so on, however many orders are required. The numbers of these depending upon the demands of the processes concerned with a particular movement. A at first, when we read this in school, it, it, it meant it meant nothing. We, uh, we it meant nothing in the sense that it was impossible to relate what is said on this sentence with what uh, was uh, happening during the lessons. During the lessons, we we were not. Uh, uh, asked to direct the movement of the parts. We were asked to respond to the hands of our teacher with the least interference possible, which, which is completely, completely different. When the hands are moving from one point, or the, the hands of the teachers, of the somatic teacher, are moving from one part to another, well, you are, uh, if you are following the hands, you are concentrating on each uh, feelings you get from the, from the hand. Or you are concentrating on the whole feeling you are getting. There is no question of uh, directing the mind or projecting orders to the different parts involved at the same time. That's the point. And this idea of uh, increasing the numbers the number of orders required for a particular action never never comes to the fore. It's something we've never... I, I swear I never worked this in my training course. I really like my teachers. They were, they were nice. They were giving us nice exper experiences with their hands. But uh, when it comes to uh, what I learn in order to direct myself consciously, uh, it, was, it was not the point. The, this idea of directing the movements of the different parts and uh, uh, continuing a primary part of a movement while the secondary part of the movement is projected, I never, I never was trained like that. It's, uh, it's after 
when I started to really think about it, that uh, I started to think that this could make sense, that it could be possible to direct uh, um, special points, anatomical landmark in, uh, in clear directions, which is clear, spatial, geometric directions. And uh, uh, these uh, movements of different parts had to be continued, not uh, you don't uh, direct one part and then stop to, uh, to go and direct another one. You have to start to think, okay, I can direct two parts in opposite directions and I, I get uh, very close to the idea that Alexander developed in the, in the early days, the antagonistic action or the uh, antagonistic movement principle. But the, he doesn't stop here. He points to the very defect. He says, ordinarily, in attempts to use two or more parts in remedial work, the primary projection ends with the correct or incorrect use of the parts concerned with the primary movement. This applies to all of the projection concerned with other parts of the movement and is another instance of concentrated effort connected with a procedure based on the end gaining procedure. So we, we see here that Alexander is uh, abundantly clear. It's, uh, it's not uh, uh, changing the relationship between the neck and the head. It's uh, that uh, it makes no sense. It's it, it, in, it cannot be considered the cause of people's difficulty. No, the cause of people's difficulty is an attitude of mind of uh, concentrating on one thing and then stopping and concentrating on something else. It's Alexander called that the mind wandering habit. The mind wandering habit is based on concentration. You concentrate on one thing, you stop and you do something else. Here, the readjustment what that we, that we teach or that I teach to my pupil in order to uh, obtain what, they, what Alexander calls here the remedial work. Remedial work is work that is done to uh, put right what has been done wrong in the past without the pupil notice. The pupil does not as he has not a, a clear uh, representation or a clear perception of the movements of the part is doing in order to stay in. It's necessary for the pupil to start uh, constructing an understanding of the movements of the different parts, how habitually all these movements are happening at the same time, and uh, answer the question as to uh, how to consciously direct these movements. It's a, it's a very interesting, uh, well, exploration, of course. He says, to finish the projection of continued conscious orders, on the other hand, calls for a broad reasoning attitude, so that, first, the subject has not only a clear conception of the order's essential means whereby for the correct performance of a particular movement, but second, he can also project these orders in their right relationship one to another the coordinated use, the coordinated series of orders resulting in the coordinated use of the organism. So, it's not just an intellectual game where you are asked to create intention with verbal orders. So we have an intention of movement for one part, an intention of movement for another part, and you want these intentions of movement to be continued while you start the movements of readjustment, and uh, so on with all the parts that are in fact uh, uh, highlighted and uh, uh, connected with the others. But uh, there is a second part, because um, uh, how do we know that the person is not engaining. Well, we know because we film the student directing the movement. And so uh, from a certain 
adjustment, which is the, the same on the four first pictures, we request for the pupil to, uh, on his own, uh, direct these movements. And we observe on the video whether the plan has been satisfactorily uh, performed or whether there are some uh, still some directions of movement that are too weak because they are too far away from the habitual uh, uh, standing equilibrium of the person. Uh, I can tell you that already this one is very, very far from the norm, from the habit. Uh, the person uh, must feel horrendous pools when, uh, and must feel out of equilibrium, of course. It's the exact opposite of what we see. The person is lengthening, the person is more balanced, the person, yes, but uh, the experience of the person is, must be awful uh, because the distance between the readjustment and the habitual adjustment of the movements of the different parts is absolutely massive. So, uh, at first, I'm very satisfied when the pupil is performing uh, a, well, readjustment, remedial work in this direction. I consider that the direction of the work is correct. Of course, the, the attitude uh, is, uh, has a lot to be uh, corrected still, but uh, compared with the uh, habitual standing uh, gesture, well, we are going in the right direction. And that is what is very important. And so this idea of uh, the lesson is, uh, of course, uh, the, the teacher must supply the clear conception of the order essential. Uh, he must and the pupil must understand from the start that we are not discussing uh, intellectual ideas or uh, somatic ideas that you could release something, that you could make your mind release, that you could think I am free and uh, be free. It has nothing, it's a, it's a technique. We understand that there are parts uh, that are moving and that uh, depending on the movement, you get different results. And so uh, the means whereby are orders. There are orders of movement essential for the correct performance of a particular movement. And we, uh, as a teacher, my job is to uh, evaluate whether uh, the pupil is capable first of understanding the orders and second of obeying the orders. So the, the person is going to start uh, building a series of intentions all related one to the other, understanding more or less what should happen when the orders are in fact obeyed as once, that we call projecting the orders. And uh, if they are projected, if these orders are projected in their right rela relationship, one to another, well, uh, the coordinate series of orders uh, result in a gesture that uh, tells us that there is a more coordinated use of the organism. It's maybe not the perfect, uh, per we d you do not attain perfection, but at least you know you're working in the correct direction. And what is very important is that during the lesson, I discuss with the pupil what, is, what are the differences and why we consider that something is wrong. Why is it that uh, pulling the neck back relatively to the middle torso, why is it that retracting the head relatively to the middle torso is considered as wrong? It's wrong because, first of all, there, in a, there is an equilibrium problem. That is not uh, obvious when you look at, uh, at a still picture. It's, uh, it becomes obvious when you ask the person to create any sort of uh, bending movement or any sort of uh, st just taking a step or just go to sit on a chair or go to stand on a chair. And it's easy to demonstrate to the person that uh, his habitual use of the mechanism of the torso impair very, very strongly his equilibrium. And the second point mm -hmm. is that, of course, uh, when the torso is bent in that way, you must understand that uh, the rib cage is completely crunched. And so uh, different functions like uh, breathing, like uh, digestion, are certainly not uh, in, uh, in good conditions of working. So we, uh, we have here 
a program. That's exactly the program of the lessons. So the program of the lessons, when somebody comes and have a lesson with me, uh, we start to analyze uh, a gesture according to different movements of the parts. These movements of the parts are in fact explicitly described so that the person well, can understand what is a wrong movement, what can be a series of wrong movements, how these series of wrong movements coordinate together, and uh, reason out, because I want my students to reason out and to find, well, if these two movements are creating a such a shortening, could there be opposite movements that would create a lengthening, a stretching, and a, a widening that would start to, in fact, uh, um, create independent forces uh, most people think of forces as uh, uh, the muscle force. Uh, most students, they ask me, uh, which muscle is doing this? And uh, very often, uh, I cannot answer straight away in the sense that uh, very often, when you start using antagonistic actions, antagonistic action produce, uh, will produce a stretch of the elastic fabric. And when you stretch an elastic fabric, you get an antagonistic response, an antagonistic pull. That is, uh, you are making movement that is stretching something, and that something that you can't feel is a spring, and that spring will start to, uh, to pull against, uh, against the directions of the movement and create a cohesive force that will maintain the part in action without any sort of uh, voluntary muscle contraction or co-contraction. To finish today, uh, I want to bring this lady to the fore. Uh, I really like the lady. She's called Jeanette Lee. You will remember her husband, Gerald Stanley Lee. Um, Gerald Stanley Lee was a minister of the church, of the in, uh, English church, and he spent a few years in England in 1917, 1919, uh, 1918, 1919. And um, he, he developed quite a close uh, working relationship with Alexander. He and his wife had nearly two years of lessons with Alexander. I do think that Alexander invested a lot in that young man. He, he thought that uh, Lee could help him. Lee was uh, Lee and his wife were uh, well intelligent characters. Both were wi writers, and Alexander certainly invested a lot in them. When uh, they disappeared from England in 1919, with uh, forgetting to pay his lessons. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine, Alexander was not too pleased, of course, and uh, when he discovered that uh, arrived in the States a very, but just a year later, uh, Mr. Lee had uh, a revelation, <laughs> uh, walking outside, uh, making a, a little stroll in the mountain, he suddenly had God talk to him, and he understood at that moment um, that... Um, the best functioning of the human organism uh, could be regained by using sentences like let the neck be free, to let the head go forward and up, to let the back lengthen and widen. He never said that he, he had lessons with Alexander or that his idea had been, well, uh, he, he, he forgot to say that Alexander was the source of his revelation. Alexander wanted to um, uh, sue him and wanted to uh, stop the publication of his book, but uh, curiously, he stopped short. He, he, normally, he would go to, to court for that, but curiously, he did not. So I don't know. That's uh, it's a, quite a strange story. So we have this uh, Janet Lee, and she's produced a book. It's called This Magic Body, and uh, it's... Um, it's much later that she, that she started to write than her husband. This is 1946, the 1946 edition. And it's, uh, it's interesting to, to read what these uh, uh, people, uh, Stanley and, and Jeanette, are saying. Um, 
it was not easy to find these uh, these books uh, because the, uh, my teachers and the first genera teach, uh, generation teacher they had a very set idea about the lees. They they saw they were crooks and uh, that they Alexander was uh, against them, was very angry and uh, disliked them uh, because uh, they were uh, proposing uh, a diluted version of his technique. When you read the books, it's very strange because it's not the idea you get. Uh, and there are ideas I've never seen elsewhere. And um, you will see, I think that these ideas come from Alexander. But uh, why the Lees were aware of that while uh, the first generation teachers were not in the 1930s, well, is uh, again a, cash, a question. So there is a, uh, I, I will start uh, with um, Jeanette because um, she, she's got geometrical uh, concept and um, she, she says, for example, to think a line from the right shoulder down through the upper arm to the elbow and a few inches beyond. And she says then something, she says that let the elbow move down this line. It's, well, for many people it's not going to be a surprise. We, we are we are aware that Alexander was uh, uh, well even in constructive conscious control when he explained the hands on the back of a chair there is this slight pull on the elbow and we see that this is uh, this is an explanation of it yes but uh, if you read before uh, then you are starting to discover that there is a whole world behind this a world world of experiments um, she says the elbow, for instance, directed to move along an horizontal line to the right or left and beginning to carry out the direction does not move horizontally, but in a slight curve, compelled by muscle combination, which utilize curves instead of a straight line to carry out their purpose. But the paradox is that the muscles, while tracing a curve, must be true to a direction to move on straight lines. If lines form if angle at a central point are kept in right angle relation, curves plot again against these lines will be true. By some law of body mechanics, grace and strength depends on keeping this line true to a right angle. Which for most people is like gibberish. It doesn't <laughs> mean much. So uh, when you read something like that, it, it's necessary to stop a second and uh, well reorders. Uh, when I copied the, the letters, you can see I, it, it, it would be necessary to order, reorder the letters. So sorry. I should not be doing this now. Um, but it's it's much better to start to. Uh, to to represent what we are discussing, yeah? So let's imagine we have a character, it's seen from above, uh, and uh, his hand is uh, holding a post. So we, we, we want the hand to stay in place. We want the torso to stay in place. And we are starting to create a, a, a straight line. So we have a straight line from the upper part of the arm to the tip of the elbow. And uh, this is a situation that I uh, often explain to my students. And I say, well, now let's, uh, let's imagine that you're holding the post, or let's say it's uh, the, the back of a chair, so that we, we, are, we make clear that we want the internal part of the, uh, of the wrist to be directed inward and stay so that the chair is not pulled out of balance. We want the, the hand to be uh, a closed end of uh, a, a link like this. And so I say to the person, do you think you can uh, move the tip of the elbow on that line? That is, uh, for example, for the moment, because we are discussing an horizontal movement, it's only outward and forward. It's, uh, there are two components to this uh, vector. One component is outward, one component is forward. And at first, when you ask the person to perform that type of action, what you will find is that uh, instead of directing the movement on a rectilinear path, immediately uh, the elbow is going to curve most of the time inward. 
well, it's easy to explain because uh, all the joints are uh, moving along uh, curves. You, you cannot make a straight line with a, a simple joint. So if you want to uh, make a straight line, you have to start uh, imagining that it is only possible if you manipulate the movement at all the joints. And it's possible. And my students are so surprised when they discover that, yes, it's possible to direct the tip of the elbow along a rectilinear line. And when uh, that is happening, you, you will see the two images, you know, they are a bit uh, exaggerated, but not that much. You know, you can see that suddenly for the elbow to move along a rectilinear line, it's first of all, it's necessary to understand that uh, the relationship between the upper arm and the torso is not simple. Uh, the upper arm is not connected directly to the torso, it's connected to the shoulder blade. And very often people are wearing their shoulder blade very far back. And as the shoulder blade are very far back, you will find that the shoulder blade are sliding around uh, the top of the rib cage that, is, that has a dome shape. So the, clo the higher you go, the closer you go to the center. So most people are wearing their shoulder blade very high. And uh, the higher you get, the further back you get. So the shortening of the muscle of the neck is really, it can be really intense. When the person start moving the tip once or direct the movement of the tip of the elbow along a rectilinear uh, axis, a mental line. Y you start to, uh, to imagine that instead of allowing the natural curve movement, you're starting to uh, create, Alexander used the term conceive, that is conceiving is something that is uh, uh, sometimes physical when you make babies, you can conceive a baby, but apart from that uh, uh, act, the only thing you can conceive is uh, intellectual. You can conceive mental lines, for example. You can conceive a, a, straight, a straight line. And you will find that if you do so, you have to pull the tip of the elbow away from the torso and away from the hands at the same time. So if you, if, if, if you play with this, you will find that suddenly it's possible to completely change the conditions of work of the different joints. Instead of compressing the joints toward each other, you are starting to stretch the joint away, well, the, the bones away from one another. You are really extending the joints just by using a conscious direction of the mind. A and the result can be, for, for some people, they say, wow, uh, uh, it looks like a very, um, well, f athletic person. I, I know it's not because it's me. It's just uh, when you direct the tip of the elbow along rectilinear, along straight lines, you suddenly get uh, the solution to a, an old problem that, um, that took me quite, a, quite some time to solve. It's uh, how to widen the upper part of the arm away from one another. This is uh, an academical uh, direction of movement that was used by Alexander. And it's... Uh, I know it because of uh, what he wrote first. He used it in constructive conscious control of the individual. And uh, also, uh, many first generation teachers were using it too. But I could not make sense of it unless uh, it was possible to direct the elbows, to pull the elbows slightly outward and downward. Exactly what Alexander is saying. But when Alexander explained the slight pull on the elbow outward and downward, uh, you cannot uh, imagine that this is discussing something that is very, very uh, clear. It's like a direction that you, the teacher may feel that you are getting wider or may feel that you are getting more organized when, when he does the pull. But how could you create the pull yourself? Well, it's very simple. We can use intentions of movements, but you must understand that for this to happen, the, the most important part is to know which movements should not happen. So we should not see any curved uh, action. 
Uh, and uh, for that to happen, it's necessary for the person to allow, allow for, for pools. Because I can tell you that when a person is used to have the shoulders so high and so close to the spine, narrowing the back and the front as well, well, when the person starts to engage into this conscious, directed movement, well, suddenly uh, there are pools everywhere. There are pools in the forearm, spoon in the elbow, and pools in, 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 in the upper torso, of course. And so uh, the idea is not to uh, place the wrong on the, on the tension. Uh, in the modern Alexander technique, uh, every teacher will tell you uh, this technique is for uh, reducing tension, unwanted tension. Well, uh, the technique I teach is for producing due tension. It's pro for producing tension where it's requested. Ligaments and tendons have to be stretched. They have to, uh, to play their part to, to bring into uh, the economy of movement of the structure and the economy of the equilibrium of the structure. They, they have, have to be stretched because it's only when stretched that they can protect the joints and that they can expand the joints. So. For today, I wanted to see to show that what is uh, wrong is not what Alexander is pointing to. He's not pointing to the wrong when he says that the neck is, uh, is, uh, is not free or that, that the neck should be free. That does not indicate the, the wrong. It indicates the right. And it's uh, uh, our task to think out uh, the means whereby, of course, there are many people, there are the least, there are other people, and Alexander himself to help us conceive these movements that coordinated together are going to, uh, well, expand the mechanism of the torso. And you must understand that this uh, idea of having uh, a straight lines principle in action is, uh, is just to make sure that we start to apply a forward movement to the upper thoracic spine. So that uh, when you look at uh, this image, you must understand that the, the big arrow at the top, how do you get the upper torso forward? Well, you need to link up the movement of the arm, the movement of the tip of the elbow, with the movement of the different parts of the torso, so that the movement that you request along a straight line with the tip of the elbow is going to produce a very strong pull forward on the upper torso and will be opposed to different pulls that are set on the lower sternum, on the lowest ribs on the side of the torso, and on the front of the pelvic bone. In that way, we can create a very clear directions of movement for the upper part of the torso and realize what we call the lengthening and widening of the back. This is it. That's it for today.